and welcome to another edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Professor Rick Burgess and Professor Bill Bubba Bussey here uh, for our standalone podcast we do most every week. Uh, this is episode 91, so if you've missed uh, the other 90, uh, you can simply go to our archives wherever you get podcasts. You can also find those on our YouTube channel there at rickandbubba.com. And Bubba, we're going to be very, very topical uh, on this edition, uh, Afghanistan. There's that word. Uh, and it is at the forefront uh, before we started recording this. Sadly, things were escalating uh, in, in Kabul at the, the airport. We had, um, they're, not, they're not using the term multiple explosions. Uh, we don't know the death toll or the injuries. We do know that some of our military have for sure been injured, three, three Marines, as of the recording of this uh, that, we, that we know. And by the time this airs, uh, there could sadly even be more. Uh, but we're going to talk to someone who's actually been – uh, not only on the ground uh, serving our military, but as a contractor, actually a, a military contractor there in Afghanistan. We're going to talk to Eric Braun. He's our guest, uh, served us uh, in the U.S. Army from 84 to 90 in Korea. He was a contractor on the ground in Afghanistan, 05 and part of 06, and then the Department of Defense contractor uh, for the rest of 06 and then 07 in Baghdad. So so welcome uh, to Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, U.S. Army veteran, uh, Eric Braun. Eric, welcome to Rick and Bubba University. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. And Rick, we met Eric uh, in what I will call the under the title "small world." He actually married one of my former classmates, uh, the former Debbie Reeves. How about that? Small, small world. And she's there with you, right, Eric? Yes, sir. Well, she just took off out of the room, but yeah, best thing ever happened to me. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I think she realizes that uh, Bubba's gonna try to bring her into this podcast and she has <laughs> she has kept that from happening yeah well debbie's been a, a great friend since literally first grade so we've known her a long time and congratulations to both of you so let's talk about you first of all eric your your, your actual and we're going to give everybody an opportunity to help a friend of yours and i tell bubba we we do a men's bible study here on wednesday i i literally had a man come up to me after the bible study this past wednesday and say do you know of any of these afghanis that i could help or we could do something for, and we're going to get, and I said, you know what? I said, we're about to do an interview uh, with uh, with Eric Braun, and yes, I'm going to have you some information on how you can help somebody uh, by the time we're done with the week. So you spent time in Afghanistan uh, all, all of 05 and part of 06 as, as a contractor. Uh, I think the American people, we've always been a little confused about the Af- Afghan situation and our presence there. We've been there for 20 years now. Uh, and now we're we're exiting in in a in a way that I think gives a lot of people concern. Uh, but with your experience, how did how did the Afghani people how did they perceive the the presence of uh, of us and our allies while you were there? Well, I guess in comparison wise, I, I'm going to compare Iraq a little bit with Afghanistan. In, in Iraq, you really didn't know who was our friend, who wasn't. Um, in Afghanistan, it's completely different. There's three types of people. They either loved you, they were indifferent, or you could tell they hated you. And I would have to say, so two-thirds, I would say, were really decent to us. Um, I always had great interactions with the civilian community, uh, with the Afghans. The, uh, the difference, though, in Americans and Afghans were if I ask you where you're from, you're going to tell me the United States. And then you're going to break it down to Alabama, Jefferson County, Birmingham, et cetera. In Afghanistan, they went the opposite way. It was tribal. And then moving up through to Afghani, being in Afghanistan, uh, from Afghanistan. I think that was in 2005. I think that's because we've been there as long as we've been. I think that's changed a lot. I think there's a lot more Afghan pride now than there was before. So. Eric, tell us a little bit about uh, about when you were there. What did you do? What can you share with us now about what you actually did on the ground? What what rank were you there, by the way? Well, there, there, as a contractor, there really wasn't a, a rank. There was more based on title. I was called a palace guard. Um, so I was. I, I actually, it's, it's another situation about who you know. I had a friend who was actually a paramedic on the Anderson Fire Department here, who got to be a paramedic. We call him Doc. He was a doc that would alternate uh, flights with President Karzai. And he got me a job over there doing this. And then when I got there, uh, we guarded three gates around the palace, Sharon, Molly, and the Vicky Gate. 
And uh, Molly was the best one to be on because you had canine there. Uh, we checked vehicles there. Sharon was the one everybody trained on. Vicky was the main gate that the president went through. But Molly was great because uh, being there, you had dogs. And, and for some strange reason, I guess, just having dogs there made it feel more calming. And uh, so we would, anyways, we would check the people, uh, check camera crews when they came in, check VIPs when they came in. It was our job just to make sure that they were secure before they went to see the press. Now, Eric, I can't help but notice all the gates seem to sound like U.S. female names. Is that <laughs> it was what, what was the, what was the deal with that? Initially, when the uh, the detail was set up, it was set up by a uh, a group of former SEALs and, and Delta Force people, as I understand it, the history of it. And uh, the the man in charge was a guy named Max, and I guess Max named them after women he knew. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So when you were there doing that type of security, um, obviously, you know, we there's the president that, that had our protection, but they were certainly, as you said, two thirds seemed to be either indifferent or very kind. But then there's the third uh, that uh, that I'm sure always wanted to make trouble, but our presence kept that from happening or deterred that. Did you? It seemed like it was very effective. Most definitely. At one point, uh, President Karzai actually brought 100 Taliban into the palace. And, of course, the part that they hated was the fact that Americans were guarding, quote, unquote, their president. So when they would come in, if, if looks could kill, we would all have been a pile of ashes. But, of course, nothing was said. They didn't say anything. Um, when we did have run-ins on uh, escort runs and things like that, no, nothing was ever said. Uh, they, they kept quiet and they kept it themselves. But you could tell who was there and who wasn't. But for the most part of 20 years after we went in, there was a, a peace in Afghanistan. There was obviously, uh, you know, from time to time, some IEDs and things. But overall, I mean, it was a fairly stable environment over most of that time. Wouldn't you say that? Oh, yes, sir. Most definitely. I mean, uh, I, I think the last, uh, you know, it's been 18 months uh, up to this point before we had any uh, – the deaths in the military, as I understand, combat-related deaths. Um, and, you know, yeah, I guess people have said, uh, was it worth it or, you know, was it for nothing? And I, no, because you got 20-year-olds that never knew what Taliban rule was like right now. you got 21-year-old women who've been to college, 21-year-old women who've been to college now. Yeah. You know, got to go to the U.K., they got to come to the States. Um, I, I think it was in a different environment. I mean, and, and yeah, it was worth it to me. Uh, of course, it's. My initial reaction was, in general, like, yeah, we, we did this for nothing. But then you start thinking about it. No, it wasn't for nothing. Like you said, they had peace. They had freedom. They've all got to experience that now. So let's see where it takes them on the next step. Yeah, I, I was. we're trying to reassure people like you, Eric, and others who have called the show that, that serve there in combat are there like you did, keeping – the, the peace and there is that sense that it was all for nothing. And we keep telling them what you, I'm glad you're saying that it really wasn't because the time that order was kept a generation. I mean, like you say, there's 23 year olds that since they've been three years old, they've known nothing but stability, which is something Afghanistan has not been known for. Yeah. For thousands of for years, thousands yeah. of years, they lived in stability and uh, women, as you said, of course, now that the Taliban has assured us that, the women will go back under strict Sharia law. Uh, but w the point you're making that, that I think may be intriguing, but there were for so long there were no Afghanis that had ever tasted stability and, and peace and, and at least the best form of freedom they'd ever seen. So maybe that, that can be a seed mm -hmm. that says, no, we, we now can tell the difference in the Taliban versus the way it was. And and maybe right. maybe that gives them some inspiration, um, you know, to to maybe I don't know, try to make change for themselves. Now we're we're struggling with that a little bit now because the um, from what we're hearing, and I know Eric, you weren't there now, but maybe you can speak to it. That a lot of the reasons that the Afghanistan military abandoned all of the weaponry that we'd given them is we didn't do a good job of communicating with them that we were leaving. So they're, they're accustomed to having the air cover from us uh, and coming back to the base and us being there, and they come back to the base and we're gone. 
uh, and they kind of panicked, didn't they, and, and, and realized they didn't have the protection anymore. It's, it's interesting. I'm kind of a history buff. I think, Bubba, you are too. Um, you know, Napoleon's success was based on logistics. He always kept a supply line with him in the military as, as he was going through. Ironically, I was a supply guy when I was initially in. And um, that seems to be the problem, is that we weren't ba- able to back them up. We weren't able to, uh, you know, keep their, their weapons going. Um, I've, I've read stories of, like, you know, we pulled our mechanics out, who, by the way, mostly contractors, um, you know, out a month ago or so. And so they had no way of keeping this equipment going. They had no way of getting food out to it. They had no way of getting any kind of logistical support. And, um, yeah, it was done... I would say it was done wrong because nobody said anything to them. I mean, if, if we had a, a series of events that say, okay, we're going to leave Afghanistan, but it's going to be based on these standards, then I could see that because you're giving warning, yeah. you're giving heads up, you're getting planning. But the way it was done is the problem. All right, we're going to come back and, and we'll continue to unpack that. And we're going to introduce uh, the, the audience uh, of Rick and Bubba University uh, to to a man that uh, hopefully we can all try to help uh, that was so beneficial and um, has found himself uh, in in a place of danger when when the Taliban uh, took back over we do believe he has safely escaped uh, and we'll get an update on that and and how we can come alongside and maybe help this family when Rick and Bubba University the podcast continues all right so Bubba you know, like I do, if you mention the word bacon around us, you're going to get our attention. Yes, you will. Let me tell you something. Can I tell you this? If you could see and taste the bacon from, from moinkbox.com, you would order it right now. And and let me tell you this. Uh, I, it, seeing it, tasting it, it, it is so delicious. And, and, and you spell it M-O-I-N-K, moink, because we're talking about bacon, moinkbox.com. Now, they do other meats as well. Their, their steaks are fantastic as well and, and and this is the the best of the best moink delivers grass-fed grass-finished beef and lamb uh pastured pork and chicken wild caught alaskan salmon directly to your door helping family farms become financially independent outside of big ag you know big ag bubba i mean what about the what about the the mom and pop farm well that's uh, that's where this meat comes from and let me tell you something uh I'm I'm pretty much a bacon and especially pork prude. Yes, you are because we're Gentiles and yep. we're born in the South. Okay, yep. Yep. let me tell you this is what the, a blessing. Yeah, this is the best of the best. Now, uh, Moink was founded by an eighth generation farmer who, by the way, Bubba, you may I don't know if you saw this episode. He was featured on Shark Tank. No, I did not. Yeah, and and, and, not. He, and he talked about you know how he could bring this product and help you know the the independent farmer. So uh, so the, the, you're going to be guaranteed. To, to love this and look if you don't love it then you know then I owe you an apology but I'm telling you something you are going to absolutely love it and you know what you'll say Bubba you'll say oink oink I'm just happy I got moinked uh, what if you said that can you say that oink now, oink you know I may have to practice it yeah, Rick but yeah. I'll be ready next yeah. time I'll I mean, tell you, you that you eat it you go oink yeah. oink I'm happy I got moinked uh, but anyway so here's what you need to do Here, here's here's join the moink movement today go to moink m-o-i-n-k moinkbox.com slash Bubba Right now, and the listeners to Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, Bubba, you ready for this, baby? Is there anything better we could say to say thank you than to give you bacon? No, not really. We're going to give you free bacon for a year. A year's worth of bacon. Good night. So just uh, just go right now to moinkbox.com slash Bubba. You get uh, free bacon for a year. That's M-O-I-N-K box.com slash Bubba. I was going to ask you how to spell it. Yeah, M-O-I-N-K. Yeah, that's good. All right, so Rick and Bubba University, the podcast here, we, we're talking with Eric Braun. Eric uh, has served our, our country uh, from 84 to 90 in the U.S. Army. Uh, he became a contractor uh, for us in uh, 05 and, and part of 06, uh, being a, a security guard there at the palace in Afghanistan. He also worked with the Department of, D- of Defense as a contractor, uh, 06, 07 in Baghdad. So uh, we're ta- we were talking, we got an email actually from Eric, and you have a connection to Eric because you – you know his wife from you guys going to yeah, school. Yeah, all the way back to first grade. All the way back to yeah. first grade. And so Eric re- reached out. So you you encountered uh, an incredible uh, man named Rocky. I'm assuming that is not his Afghan name. Rick, before we yeah. go to Rocky, I, I wanted to ask yeah, Eric ahead, this sure. on, on, a, on a broader scale. 
Eric, did you did you get a sense that the Afghanis were not going to be able to hold the line, so to speak, against question. the Taliban? Because we've we've talked to a lot of people back from the very first people that went in cave to cave to people that were there in the latter days, and most of them across the board have told us they never thought they were going to be able to do it. Did you feel that way? In two thousand five, it was uh, I would say they. So I was in contact with two types of Afghan soldiers, ANA, which is the Afghan National Army, Mm -hmm. and we called them BGs, which were the bodyguards. The difference was the uh, ANA wore uh, old jungle fatigues like I used to wear when I was in back in the day. Right. We see them, the Taliban wearing them now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course. Now, the BGs wore the desert camo. So the BGs were sort of like the upper level. Uh, They were a lot better trained than the ANA were. Uh, I know in the early days there was problems with the, with the regular army. Um, I mean, being honest, some of the guys would just go home because they they got homesick, and they would leave their posts and things like that. Now, having said that, also talking to and keeping in contact with people who are both both in the military and contractors over there, the A and A have com- really have really come around. The training has totally improved. Um, they could be depended on. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think they've certainly evolved to where they could have, had we been able to support, had we been able to do what we, what they were saying we, we should have been able to do is provide them with food, fuel, you know, keep their, their equipment running. Yes. I think the ANA could have held them back. You know, we we're getting reports now, uh, from Afghanistan that the Taliban was planning on mounting an offensive, and we knew that. But they thought it would take them six months to a year just to get to, to Kabul uh, and Kabul. And then they thought there would be an extended period of time to fight, and they thought that's where the biggest battle would be to take that city. But they literally had no resistance. I mean, the, the, the Afghani National Army just surrendered on sight in most of these places they they couldn't drive fast enough to get to the capital yeah and it seems like eric you're saying that that mainly happened by the way we did withdraw i mean we can decide bub and i have been back and forth on this and i'd love to get your opinion on it uh i don't know if if we need to be there to keep that place stable which we did for 20 years uh and 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 and, and, and we need to get intel on terrorist training financing uh the sales and we just need to be there. Then I got news for you. We just passed a budget right now that's that's got got so much pork in it, and and is is more money than we've spent on how many wars? Oh, all of them we've ever fought. And 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 it's, and it's full of waste. It, so I really don't want to hear about the cost because apparently, as a country, we have no issue wasting money. <laughs> but but so so why not invest right. money? You know, I heard even President Trump, former President Trump, saying you know it's forty two. What billion dollars a year to be there? Yeah, something. Or, or 120 something. million a day yeah, or something. I something forgot like what the that. number was. But but anyway, but if we need to do it, apparently, as long as we need to do it, the money doesn't seem to be an object when it comes to our government. But if we needed to just stay there and have a presence there, like we have done uh, after uh, you know past wars to keep a presence and to keep order, then we should have done it. But if you're not going to do that, and I know both President Trump and President Biden wanted us out. So this is not even a Republican Democrat thing. I'm right. I'm I'm now down to the way that you leave, and and it sounds like uh, what you're saying is that the the AAs were getting trained enough that they could have withheld the Taliban with the equipment that we gave them if we had got a better plan on how to leave and kept we had to at least help them keep it maintained. That's your point. For what we right. keep hearing is they they fled because they didn't know we were just going to leave and leave that vacuum. And they, they didn't have a transition of us making sure they were stable enough to fight off the Taliban uh, and, and slowly walk our way out. Am I, am well, I, yeah, am I oversimplifying that? No, you're not because it, you know, it, it's like, it's not what you said. It's how you say it. Right. Hey, this is the exact same situation. It's not pulling out. That was the problem. It's the way they did it. So you can't, you cannot gut an army the way we did in my opinion, and then expect them to stand there with, uh, you know, not enough ammunition. They know this. And they also know psychologically they don't have the American support. Now, if I'm, and I, and I will certainly be up for correction on this, but 
as I understand it, we had 2,500 troops in Afghanistan yeah. before all this happened. Yes, that's correct. Now, if we can hold back the Taliban with just 2,500 troops, then that tells you, yes, they. I, to me, the ANA could have done it if we kept supporting them. But, I mean, so you're, you're talking about a minimal military force that was enough to keep the Taliban back. And we take out 2,500 troops, and then they rush through along with all the other contractors, too. I'm not negating them because there's a lot of them there, too. So. Uh, before we get to Rocky, one more uh, question, Eric. So if logistics and supply lines was a problem for the ANA, how in the world did the Taliban, who had been beaten down, we couldn't even find them anymore, get organized, have their supply lines, have their equipment, and and basically blitzscreen the country in about two weeks? Uh, that's a real good question, Bill. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that uh, somebody has to be behind them. They didn't do it on their own. You know, just like, I guess that's a great comparison because just like with uh, the ANA can't do it all alone, I don't think the Taliban could do it all alone either. So I think there was somebody... And, and this is strictly my opinion. I, I, you know, I'm not basing this on secret squirrel intel or something like that, but I would have to say that somebody somewhere is supporting this effort. Well, and you have to think too, um, if, if the Taliban members are 40 years old, and I assume they would be younger than that, maybe 30, uh, they were 10 when the Taliban went away. So how did they, I mean, how did they prepare for this? How did they communicate? How did they finance? Like I said, it's, it's, it's odd to me that they stayed intact that well for 20 years when most of their fighters would have died off naturally by then and be ready to go at the, at the way they did. You know, it just, like you said, it's almost, it, it's very strange how their logistics work so well. And the ANA did not. Yeah, you know, you, you... Keep in mind, a lot of their leadership also came out of Guantanamo Bay. Um, and when it did, they go to countries that are favorable to the Taliban. Um, I mean, I, I'm not going to create an international incident because most people know <laughs> that Pakistan loved to uh, right. you know, right. protect Taliban. And I think they were waiting on the border until the day that, you know, you start hearing grumblings and rumors that the Americans are going to leave. They're amassing. They're getting their funds together. They, they've always... It's not, it's not like you quit the Taliban. The Taliban has always been the Taliban. They'll always be ready to take over. And they're opportunists, and this was a great opportunity. Do, do you think, from what you saw, was the Taliban organized, or were they more just like what we would think of gangs or uh, thugs or just outlaws that were loosely associated, or, or were they more organized with a central command and a communication system and all that? I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how they're organized. I know that I've talked to uh, some some guys that were involved in, in uh, certain operations that had a great deal of respect for them. Uh, they respected the way they fought. They were a, a difficult enemy to find, uh, to fight. So, you know, I'm not really sure about the, the uh, run and shoot aspects of the Taliban, but I would say that... Uh, I would say most soldiers respected them for their ability to fight. Eric, you, you were telling us about a um, uh, an interpreter that you had a friendship with. Yes. T uh, set, set that up and tell yeah, us a little yeah, bit about yeah. him. T tell us uh, about uh, you guys. Um, I tell you what, let, let's take a break, and then we'll come back. Cause we're, we want to unpack uh, this uh, this interpreter that had uh, uh, served you guys so well, you, you developed a friendship with. And, of course, immediately when all this started happening, you had a concern for it. So we'll come back, and, and we'll, we'll jump in, and we'll introduce you to this interpreter and continue to talk about, uh, you know, how we got where we are, what's going on uh, in the chaos that is Afghanistan when Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, continues. So, Bubba, another thing that can be very chaotic, and I know, I, look, I, we've been there. You, you get yourself, even if you have a wheel, and then what? Things change. Uh, yeah. say, say you were responsible, you got it done when you and your spouse got married. And then all of a sudden you, at that time you didn't have any kids or you had one kid. Now you got three kids. Uh, now your kids are older. Now you're getting older. Your job changed, your income changed. Maybe you picked up some property that, and you realize that your will and, and your testament is completely outdated. And you keep thinking, I need to do something about this. 
but you know in order to do it, you're going to have to stop everything. It's going to take time. It's going to be a hassle. And nobody wants to deal with that kind now, of stuff. I think, you know, when I, when that, when I, we were first approached by trustandwill.com slash Bubba, uh, the main thing that they were bringing to the table, and it is the most trusted name in online estate planning, the category leader. Uh, and, and so it was this. I don't think people are trying to be irresponsible. They just know the process is, is not marriage, so they keep putting it off, and they keep thinking, well, I'll get to that. This is the answer, by the way, you've been looking for. This is it. For as little, are you ready for this? For as little as $39, you can nominate guardians for your children, determine who gets the stuff, plan future medical care, all from the comfort of your home. Uh, now, you go out and hire a traditional estate attorney. <laughs> you, hey, we're, hey. We're talking about thousands. Here we go. And normally, they'll use a one-size-fits-all template uh, that's not nearly specialized enough. Trust and will documents are designed by state planning experts and they're customized for the actual state in which you live. And their live customer support is available to you seven days a week. Trustandwill.com's team is available to answer any question you have while you're setting up your plan. So use the most trusted name and online estate planning for as little as $39 a month you can get this black cloud that's hanging off of you. You know, you're thinking, oh, just, I need to do it. I need to do it. Go make that move now. Get that peace of mind at trustandwill.com slash Bubba. We'll get you 10% off, uh, plus free shipping of your customized legal documents. Don't wait on this. You've been putting it off. I know. I understand. Go right now. It's really important. Get 10% off, plus free shipping, by going to trustandwill.com slash Bubba. That's trustandwill.com slash Bubba. Getting this handled does not have to be expensive, nor does it have to be so complicated. Rick and Bubba University, the podcast, our guest is Eric Braun. Eric is, is giving us a look, Bubba, on, on what it's like uh, as he served our country uh, and also spent time as a contractor there uh, doing security uh, with our troops uh, in Afghanistan. And, uh, and so we've kind of you know talked to him about the situation we're in, how we got there, was there a better way to do it, but we also have a personal story involving uh, uh, an interpreter that you introduced us to named Rocky. Tell us how you met him and who this is. Well, when you when you first show up over there, of course, you train, uh, you train on Sharon Gate. And one of the first Afghan nationals to introduce themselves, or, or even I got to know, was Rocky. His name is Gowruman or something like that. But like I said, don't ask me to say his real name. We, we just stick with Rocky. And... Um, Rock came down there to see me and introduced himself. He was very polite, uh, very well-mannered, looked very professional. His clothes were ironed and pressed, which was I, I found ironic. Um, but anyways, uh, he introduced himself. And so as I progressed and got my training up to where it needed to be, I got, like I said, I went to Molly Gate. And uh, Molly Gate was great because you had the dogs there. But if you reported to that gate and you found out that Rocky was working with you that day, it was just another calming effect uh, because he was honest, he was um, very respectful uh, in dealing with people, and and probably the most important thing on any interpreter was his loyalty. Yeah. So when when you met him, uh, he would work with you, or he could be at any of the gates. But when you had him there, uh, that that was that was a special day, it, and and there was no doubt in your mind that he was lo- he could be trusted, and he remained loyal the whole time that. And that he's been working there? Absolutely. I mean, you can uh, – I was talking to Debbie about this analogy. You know, when you meet somebody who's a Christian but doesn't have to tell you they're a Christian? Yeah. That they have something about them. There's a peace. There's a calm about them. That's the way Rocky was. Now, of course, he, he is a Christian, but, I mean, he had that effect on you that you knew this guy was good. He would – and, of course, we tease him. He teases right back. You know, he gave it to us. Um but uh, very again, very respectful. I, I I often thought when this first happened, like I'm thinking about Rocky. Am I the only you know getting all emotional about Rocky? You know, quit being a, a you know silly or whatever. But then you start looking. Like I ask questions on Facebook. I just happen to make a post. Hey, I'm thinking about my uh, fellow contractors, and then this great guy named Rocky was over there. I wonder where he's at. And um, because without a doubt if the Taliban got a hold of him, he would not be here right now. There's no doubt. I already know of five that have been taken out. Mm. So, you know, uh, 
so I started doing the research. And the next thing I know, these people are popping up. Yeah, yeah, I've talked to Rocky. He's here. He's doing this. So there are contractors that dealt with Rocky 20 years ago, 15 years ago, like when I was there, that have pulled all, every string they can do to get Rocky out of there. So we had many interpreters, but for the, but the fact that they have worked so hard to get Rocky out of there speaks to his character and that I wasn't off on my thinking. Yeah, and, and is it true? I'm looking at some of this information you gave us on him that you were actually invited to his wedding. I mean, you couldn't go, but you guys were that close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so w- w- when you were, you were obviously concerned because the Taliban and you said, sadly, others have already been taken. They, yeah. they want Rocky. Uh, but Rocky, do we have an update on where he is? Has he gotten out of Afghanistan safely? Yeah. Um, it was fantastic. Uh, one of the former contractors has now worked his way up uh, through the system, was able to get many strings pulled with the help of other contractors and other uh, military personnel. And we got him. He got out. I would say we because I had nothing to do with that. Just been a follower. Um, and he's in Qatar right now. I always want to say Qatar. but Yeah, me too. Uh, he's, yeah, he's in Doha, Qatar. Um, he's doing really well. Um, last update I got was yesterday. Uh, I got a text message from um, one of the guys who's who's watching what's going on. Um, used to be a contractor at KPD where I was at, and um, yeah, I'm just I'm thrilled to death. He's got six kids now. Um, uh, like I said, he got married in '05, so he didn't waste any time, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, he invited me to his wedding, and and I told him, Rock, I said, you know I can't go, and I certainly certainly can't go unarmed. And I said, you don't want six guards showing up at your six American mm-hmm. guards showing up at your wedding. And he just smiled. He said, no, I just wanted you to have this. Wow. So, yeah. So what, what is the next step? I, I know that we're, we're going to talk about, you know, how, cause I assume that if you're an, have been an interpreter, uh, for the, for the Americans and you've been helping protect the palace of, um, the president who, by the way, is gone now. Um, right. so, um, and, and you have to get out. I assume you just have to get out period. I, I wouldn't assume he has right. any place to live. He, I'm sure he has what kind of belong, any indication you you found out about what he was able, able to even get out with. As far as I know, uh, there was a picture, uh, I sent you, uh, it's on my Facebook page too. So it's not, it's not like top secret or anything like that, but there's a picture and they're holding bags. And to my knowledge, that's all the worldly possessions they have right now. Um, Stepping back a little bit, you brought up a point. Uh, about a month or so ago, Rock was contacted by the same guy and said, hey, have you got your visa and stuff together? And this was when the president of Afghanistan was there. So Rock, Rock worked in the same office with the president. Um, and he said, no. He says, uh, I don't want to. I want to stay here and build my country. And, mm-hmm. I, and, I, and I highlight that point because it goes back to that loyalty part I was talking about. So one day he shows up at the palace and the president's gone. And... This guy calls him and he says, in his words, Rocky was in shock. And so he decided then, you know, we need to do something. So, yeah, backtracking a little bit, he, he was he was ready to stay and help build his country under the right terms. No, I think that's important to make that point. So, really, if the president would have stayed and the, the military would have decided we will defend our country and we're not going to let it be taken over by the Taliban, Rocky would have stayed and fought alongside them. Yes, sir. Absolutely. But when the president leaves and says, Hey, I'm out, uh, and, 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 and everybody leaves, I guess right. it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, that almost on a dime, he had to change his whole plan. He had to. And it, it, it and knowing rock, it wasn't for his own sake. It was for his family. I guarantee you it had everything to do with his family. So do you, do you know where he is or what the plan is? You said he's in Cutter. Yeah. What is the plan, and what are you trying to do? Yeah, because he 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 want, he's gonna. We're trying to get him to the states, right? Yeah, um, I've got a uh, trying not to get emotional about it. But I got a great boss, former boss. Yeah. Um. Wow. Yeah. His name we call you know we all have call signs over there. It isn't it isn't like we're trying to be secret about it. But if you have three Daves on the compound, you go you know you're on the radio. Go hey Dave, come here. You get three guys show up. So no, that's we right. all had to have our unique. Signs. Mine was UConn because my son at the time was a big UConn basketball fan, and Blue 
uh, we called him Blue was my boss because he was a former police officer, but he's also uh, a Vietnam veteran who was with the second Marine recon in the battle of way city. And blue lives in Midland, Texas, along with this main person who's been helping Rocky get out of there. Uh, blue was had the unique opportunity to go to, go to high school with Laura Bush. Uh, when the Bushes came over to the embassy in Afghanistan, he got to meet her and they hung out like old friends or whatever. So he, uh, is destined for Midland, Texas, um, as far as we know, uh, the way everything's going. He has a he has a sponsor there. Um, you asked about the time in Cutter. He's got to be vetted, which, like you say, shouldn't be very long, and uh, finish processing his paperwork for his family. He's working closely with the U.S. commander there, so um, he's already seen favor already. All right, when we come back, we're going to tell you how, how we can help. Uh, maybe we can help Rock get settled, and, and hopefully the we get him to Midland, Texas, uh, it would be a great way for we as, uh, uh, you know, countrymen to say thank you for the help you gave our people while we were there in harm's way. Uh, it would be the least we could do. So we'll talk about that when we come back uh, on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. All right, so, you know, we're talking about security. I mean, we're sitting here talking to Eric about uh, being uh, uh, working in security. Uh, but many times, uh, you know, those of us out there that maybe don't have the training, uh, like our guest, and, and we, we certainly love the right to, to own a weapon, but maybe we, we were looking for weapons, too, that, that we, don't have, we don't have to use to have, you know, when accidents happen, the severe consequences. And a lot of people have, have started taking on, you know, a taser as something that is a, a non-lethal but still gives you the self-protection that you, that you need. They're small. They're, they're lightweight. They're easy to carry. Uh, with you, you can even put them in, you know, for ladies out there, if you're more comfortable with this, put them in your purse. Uh, for men, you can keep them in, you know, your truck, your automobile. Uh, you can put them in, you know, in your pocket. They're powerful enough to uh, uh, incapacitate the attacker. Uh, but again, uh, they're, they're not uh, lethal. So the, the, the issue with accidents is reduced greatly. But, you know, if you're, if you're going to get a taser, where in the world am I, am I going to get a taser from? Well, go to taser.com. Uh, and use the promo code Bubba. That's T A S E R dot com. Promo code Bubba. Uh, more than two hundred and thirty-seven thousand lives have been saved with the Taser network of devices, apps, uh, and personnel. Uh, so uh, they use an electric charge to immobilize an attacker for up to thirty seconds, and that allows you the time you need to escape and also send emergency dispatch to your GPS location. All of this works the way the lasers are designed. Uh, so you can uh, own a, a taser device, the number one choice of law enforcement agencies. These are the ones they use. So protect your family, uh, and, and they're, they're available without a per- permit in most of our United States. Uh, get the Taser Plus, I mean the Pulse Plus, or the Taser Strike Light. Pick the one you like or get one of each. Go to taser.com with the promo code Bubba. We'll save you 15%. That's taser.com, promo code Bubba. Restrictions apply. Check out the site for all the details. Eric Braun is our guest on Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. We were just introduced to uh, an interpreter that was very helpful to Eric and many of our contractors and our, our military personnel in Afghanistan, uh, super loyal, uh, beloved by those that served with him. Uh, and he was ready to stay and fight against the Taliban until he realized that uh, the president had left the palace. Uh, and it looked like uh, the Afghanistan people, uh, were, the Afghani people were not going to fight. So that has put Rocky in a different situation. It's obvious he had to flee the country. The Taliban would have killed him as soon as they got their hands on him. Uh, sadly, that, that may have taken place or they, others have been taken prisoner. Rocky has gotten out with, with help from people that he worked with while, uh, during his time there. Uh, we believe he's made it to Qatar where he's being vetted out. And ultimately, he, his wife, and six children, we'd love to see them get safely to the United States, and we think uh, on to somewhere in Texas. So um, a GoFundMe account has been set up. Talk to us a little bit, Eric, about the things we need to try to do. I mean, uh, I'm I'm at, like, ground zero here. I, I have no idea. I just know I want to do something. Yeah. And uh, the best way I can think of, like I said, with him not having any type of possessions whatsoever um, people ask me, well, why, what are the sponsor or things like that? Well, you know, he's going to be just like any other refugee. I believe he's going to, you know, it's going to depend a lot on the, uh, the hospitality uh, of this country. Um, 
You know, I've told my wife, I said, he, there are a lot of immigrants that have come into this country. We're made of immigrants and it's great, but he's already got a jump start on what a lot of them, you know, have already done. So he's already done more for our country than most already, if you know what I'm trying to say. Sure, yeah. exactly. So I, I think there's a, a bit of debt we owe. I mean, we know that our government is going to take care of him. Um, not, not, not the proper way. So uh, it's going to, I think, depend a lot on us, people who knew him, to try and uh, raise some money. Uh, like I said, I, I'm, the GoFundMe account is, you know, set up so we can get food and clothes and, and I don't know, put a deposit on an apartment for all I know. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to get some toys for the kids. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, it's going to be as big a cultural shock for him coming here, I think, as it was for me going there. Uh, you know, I'm sure he's got, I, I can't imagine in his head, you know, what's he worried about? Is like, they're going to accept him here. Is he going to, uh, you know, what's he going to do, et cetera, et cetera. Well, here's some ways to help. So if you'd like to email Eric just to say, hey, I have some questions, myfriendrocky at yahoo.com. Myfriendrocky at yahoo.com. Now for GoFundMe, you again just search uh, at GoFundMe, my friend Rocky. Search that and you'll see the GoFundMe account. Because you're, you're right. I mean, imagine, just, just put yourself in his position. Imagine if the roles were reversed, you had to flee your country with your spouse and six children, and you're about to land somewhere where you have never lived, and you, because everyone was trying to imprison you or kill you, and possibly your family, you gathered bags of whatever you could, and you left a country where you had lived all your life to go to a country you'd never been. Uh, so, you know, there's nothing that helps you get settled in more than to have finances. I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta have working currency, uh, for the country in which you're about to abide. Uh, so this, this is the, the, because what do we always say, Eric, man, I just want to do something. There's something I can do Well, this. Is, here it is. I mean, you, we can do this. So, uh, go to GoFundMe and search my friend Rocky. And if you have any other questions, uh, just email Eric and, and the folks that are working to help their friend, my friend Rocky at yahoo.com. And, and I really believe you're going to see a great response to this, Eric. I, I, I really do. And it, yeah, I, I hope so. Well, it, it's, let's face it. Uh, our, our country has got a lot of problems, but there's still some really, really kind, good people here. And, and we, we usually do a pretty good job when there's a crisis and we're asked to respond. And, and, and we're in this country, we've all been put in a very unique position that we have been blessed beyond comprehension and are able to help when somebody needs it. Rick, Rick what kind of time do we have left? I have another question you got for to, Eric. You got to th- about two and a half minutes. Okay. Well, just real quick, Eric, when you're, you're sure. guarding, just from a curiosity standpoint, uh, and I know it's, it, it certainly had danger more sure. sometimes than others. But what, right. what kind of uh, armament did you have, uh, did you carry with you? I mean, did you have the M16 loaded, locked and loaded, ready to go at all times? Or, or how did that how did that play out with your job? Everything that I had locked and loaded was locked and loaded. Uh, I, we, we, at the time, it, we carried Glock 19s. Uh, it was locked and loaded. I carried it uh, on a leg holster. And then um, I had an M4, uh, which was locked, locked and loaded also. Um, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to be kind of corny, but the biggest weapon I had was my ability to have, uh, to talk to people. Yeah. You can talk your way out of anything. And, and, and really it's a really good, uh, calming thing. Uh, side note, the biggest problem we had was Americans coming through the gates. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And now you got to remember we had Al Jazeera there. They were the most polite people in the world coming through. Uh, one of the worst people was uh, Christian. I'm on poor. Yeah. Uh, I think if I corrected Correctly said that yeah. name, but yeah. CNN, CNN. Yeah, yeah. I, I just had to throw that in because she still chaps me up to this day. But anyways, so what was yeah. that? Was that just kind of an arrogance? Did they 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 yeah, were privileged? Absolutely. Like you know, who are you to stop me? You know, you know, we're all one and the same. And it was always a problem. It was always a problem. It, it's just like the rules aren't weren't bent any different for them than they were anybody else. It just that's what our job was. Yeah, and you would think it'd be pretty easy to recognize that. Well, Eric, um, thank you so much for uh, the service you've given our country, both uh, as uh, you know a, a military man and and a, a security contractor. Uh, we're, we're forever grateful. Uh, you obviously um, um, uh, love this guy, and that, that you guys work together in a very dangerous situation. And I think we'll, you'll see the audience respond. And 
and we'll try to get a fund set up so when he gets on the ground, you and those who love him uh, can get him the resources he needs. And thank you for taking time to be with us today. No, thank you all. I appreciate this format. It's been great. All right, so once again, Thanks, let's, let's hit it. Go to GoFundMe and go to My Friend Rocky. Search that. And if you need to email to find out more, my friend Rocky at yahoo.com. Thank you, Eric, and thanks to all of you for joining us on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. So here's one correction we need to give you uh, on this edition of Rick and Bubba University, the podcast. Uh, you still will be searching for Rocky, comma, my friend, and the comma is important, but you can type that in at fund, F-U-N-D, care.org fundcare.org, not GoFundMe. Okay, unfortunately, GoFundMe is not going to do this. So, But but FundCare is. So fundcare.org, search the name Rocky, comma, use the punctuation, my friend, uh, and you will be able to find it. And if you feel so led to help, you certainly can. And we thank you in advance.